All right. Good morning, everyone, and joy to be with you and share with you from God's precious word. We're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel today. And so I'd like you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter one. I'm going to read the first three verses of chapter one and then uh, verse 28 uh, from chapter one. So uh, just uh, beginning in verse one and kind of our, our theme, by the way, today is going to be an introduction really to the prophecy of Ezekiel. So just kind of a, a general introduction. So it begins this way, uh, verse 1 of, of Ezekiel chapter 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And then I want to just read from kind of the last part, if you like, 28b. Uh, it just simply says this. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, and when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word to us this morning. We just kind of read those introductory uh, verses for a particular purpose. One is that it gives us the uh, the, the name of the prophet, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, we also learned uh, the timing of his call. We'll look at some of these things we also learned that he began his ministry with a vision of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And we're going to emphasize very definitely that Ezekiel is the prophet of the glory of God. And if you want to know about the glory of God, Ezekiel is a good place to, to go and learn about that topic. So just by way of general introduction, of course, uh, we know that uh, he's part of what we call the major prophets of which we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, of course, Lamentations would be part of those major prophetic writings. Ezekiel and Daniel, fourth of the fifth major prophets. And we do know a lot about him. In fact, in terms of chronology and dating, uh, there's no easier book than Ezekiel to know when it was written, to know the details of the timing of all these events. Cool. And so what we can say with, without hesitation is that he was born during the time of Josiah's revival. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah, and he ministered, and we know the exact time, from 593 BC to 571 BC. So we're talking about 600 years approximately before the birth of Christ. And uh, we, we can be so specific because of how he dates his prophecy. And we'll, we'll point that out as we go through. Uh, but what we can say is this, that at age 25, he was taken captive in 597 BC by Nebuchadnezzar, together with the cream of Judean nobility. The first wave had already been taken into captivity, which included Daniel, in 605 BC. And now the second wave of deportations from the land of Judah into captivity in Babylon, uh, which took place in 597 BC. This was uh, part of that second wave where Ezekiel was taken captive, 25 years of age. Now we notice in chapter 1 verse 3, it says the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest. So we learn that he was a priest. Now, as a priest, uh, at 30, he would have begun his ministry uh, in the temple. But of course, uh, that's not going to happen to him because he's in captivity. He's miles away uh, from Jerusalem and the temple. And yet at the same time, in the mercy of God, uh, he, he tells us he's taken captive age 25, but he says in verse 1, now it came to pass in the 30th year, the fourth month, fifth day of the month, I was among the captives of the, uh, up by the river of Kibar. The heavens were opened. I saw visions of God. And so five years into captivity, instead of 
going into the temple and beginning his service as a priest, God, in his mercy, gave him visions of God. In a sense, he saw the glory of God rather than going into the temple and going through the temple ritual. He actually was given the, the great privilege of getting a glimpse, as it were, of the glory of God. He saw heavens opened. I saw visions of God, he says. So he never really functioned as a priest, uh, but he did function as a prophet. And uh, he was um, uh, separated from the temple, but instead God had a different role and a different ministry, uh, which he was to give to him. He preached to the captives. Uh, a preacher, if you like, in a concentration camp uh, where all the deported uh, Jews had been gathered together by this river Kiba. Many actually think it was the Grand Canal. And many actually believe that just as when um, the nation of Israel were in Egypt, that they were partly involved in the building of the pyramids and all the great kind of treasures of Egypt. Uh, well, it would seem, uh, and many believe this, that these captives Part of the project that they were on were actually digging this Grand Canal, what he calls the River Kiba. So they're there, as it were, in these, these camps, uh, work camps, labor camps. And this is where he is given the call to minister. And he would be a missionary to his own people. Not an easy task. Uh, in fact, he even tells us it would have been easier if God had sent him to a people of a foreign language. If you look with me, please, to chapter 3, Ezekiel 3, and we're going to read verses 5 and 6. It says, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not, not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they'll not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impotent and hard-hearted. So imagine this. God calls him, and he says, I'm not sending you to a, a people of a strange language, because they would pay attention. They would listen to you. Even though it would be hard to learn the language, they'd be receptive to hear your message. But I'm sending you to your own people, and they're not going to listen to you. I mean, how encouraging is that? You start in your ministry and you're told they're not going to listen to you. Uh, they're not going to pay attention to you. And he said, because they're they're hard hearted. They're a hard hearted people. So that's who he's called to. And interestingly enough, his name means uh, God strengthens. The name Ezekiel means God strengthens. And he's going to need that because he's already told he's, a, he's, he's coming to a people who, uh, even though he doesn't have a language barrier, the barrier is the hardness of the hearts of the people. And it does remind us a little bit of our own day. You you read of, of missionaries uh, in foreign places and, and such receptivity to the gospel. I remember being in, in Africa and preaching there and being translated and uh, preaching the gospel. And people just were getting saved. It was just incredible. There was such fertile ground. And uh, it was just it was amazing how responsive they were. And yet you you come back here and you're preaching in your own language, but people really can be quite hard and quite resistant. And so that was his situation. So God uh, strengthens is his name, and he's going to need all the strength of God to do this work. In fact, we might say this, when God calls to any service, he will himself enable the one he calls to fulfill that service. When he gives a commission, he will also give the power to execute the commission. And so uh, a lot is uh, said in this name, God strengthens. And he's definitely going to need it because he's going to minister to a rebellious house. Now, I want you just to notice uh, just something uh, in this book. And if you turn with me, please, uh, to chapter two now, I just want to point out how many times God calls the, the 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 people of Judah, these in captivity, the the Israelites, as it were, uh, how he calls them a rebellious house. So, chapter two, verse two, 
uh, sorry, verse three, chapter two, verse three, it says, he said unto me, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. Verse five, they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there's been a prophet amongst them. Again, the end of verse six, he says, though they be a rebellious house, verse seven, uh, he talks at the end of verse seven, for they are most rebellious. Verse eight, but thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, open thy mouth and eat what I give thee. And so again, we got this emphasis and it, it continues through the book. Uh, we, we get into, uh, again, chapter uh, three and we'll notice Verse 9, as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead, fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And I'm not going to give you all the references, but you'll find uh, in chapter 3, 26 and 27, it says it again. Uh, you'll see it in chapter 12. You'll see it in chapter 17. You'll see it in chapter 24. And the final reference, and maybe we'll look at this one in 44 and verse 6, Ezekiel 44, verse 6, the final reference to this rebellious house. Now it says, verse 6, he says, And thou shalt say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you for all your abominations. And so clearly he has a difficult task. He is sent, in a sense, to the house of Israel, but they're no longer really the house of Israel. They are the house of rebellion. They're a rebellious house, a house that are in rebellion against God. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about rebels just for a minute. It's not my favorite topic to speak on, but seeing as we're dealing with a rebellious house, it would be interesting to just make some remarks about rebels. And so uh, a verse in Proverbs chapter 17, which is, uh, very helpful for us to understand. It says, an evil man seeketh only rebellion. So it comes really out of an evil heart. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. In other words, the way of the transgressor is hard. In the rebel, uh, the one who is intent on rebellion, God will send a cruel messenger to that rebel. Well, God has sent a cruel messenger to the house of rebels in that the Babylonians have come and they have begun to take the Israelites, the house of rebels, into captivity. It's not over yet. There's still uh, those still in, in the land of Judah. Uh, two waves have taken place. Uh, there's the final destruction of Judah to come, including the temple. So quite clearly... Uh, this idea of a rebellious house is one of the themes uh, that we're going to see in this book. So we might ask the question, well, what is a rebel? A rebel is somebody who defies or resists some established authority. And of course, these people have for a long time been defying and resisting the authority of God, his authority over them. It's the idea of being opposed to any kind of control. It's this idea of being defiant, uh, difficult to treat and handle. Rebels are hard to treat, hard to deal with. Uh, they're not easy to, to, to deal with. And so he's no longer dealing with the house of Israel, but he's addressing the house of rebels. They are a rebellious house. Now, they're eager to return to Jerusalem, but they're not eager to return to the Lord. And that's part of his difficulty. A rebel, rebellious people, they, they, they want to be done with their chastening. They want to go back to the land, but they, they don't want to go back to the Lord. And so this is, this is the difficulty that Ezekiel finds himself in. Now, he is a contemporary of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah ministered to those left in captivity, uh, it, it, uh, left, sorry, left in the, in the homeland in, in Jerusalem or in Judah. Whereas Ezekiel, he ministers to those in captivity already. Jeremiah had been ministering for four years when Ezekiel was born. 
34 years already when Ezekiel was called. In fact, remember, he was taken captive when he was 25. And I suspect that Ezekiel uh, heard Jeremiah preach when he was living in Jerusalem before he was taken into captivity. But now he finds himself a, as it were, a co-prophet, one in the land, one amongst the captives. Just an interesting side note, which I find fascinating, is that the two prophets that stayed in the land, they weren't taken into captivity, but they ministered and told the story of the captivity. Uh, Isaiah, even though he predates uh, the Babylonians, he spoke about the Babylonians, he spoke about the captivity, he spoke about the, the land of Judah going into captivity. And again, his name, Isaiah, and then we have Jeremiah. And notice that they both have the A-H at the end of their names. And the thought here is that uh, that's kind of uh, one of the Jehovah or Yahweh derivatives. And so both guys who are in the land ministering, their names are connected to Jehovah or Yahweh, which is interesting because that is the personal name for God that was known by Israel. Amongst Israel, he was known as Yahweh or Jehovah. The two prophets that are in captivity, Daniel and Ezekiel, their names end with El or Elohim, which is the more generic name for God, the God that we might say is the God of the nations, uh, the God of creation, uh, the God of history. And so it's just, just an interesting twist, isn't it? That the ones that are in the land, they still have Jehovah connected with their names. The ones that were in captivity, their names are connected with Elohim. Now, that may not seem of interest to you, but I find those kind of things absolutely fascinating. And I, I believe there's a, you know, God knows and God God raised up the ones with those names to, to speak to those that were still supposedly in a personal relationship with God. And then those already in chastisement, he used the other name. Although he never mentions Jeremiah in his prophecy, uh, his compatriot and fellow prophet, he does mention Daniel on three specific occasions. So although Daniel went with the first wave, Daniel's piety and wisdom had already made an impression in the land of Babylon when Ezekiel was taken captive. So let me just give you a couple of examples here. Look at Ezekiel 14, Ezekiel chapter 14, and we'll look at verse 14 and verse 20. Ezekiel 14, it says, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Verse 20, For thus, uh, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. And of course, the thought here in chapter 14 is this, that in past times, uh, God has heard the cries of intercessors. And so, for instance, when God was going to destroy the nation of Israel after the golden calf, Moses interceded and God listened and spared the nation. Even Abraham, when he was interceding for Sodom, uh, he went down to 10. If there's 10 righteous, and God said, if there's 10 righteous, I will spare them. If he'd have kept going, maybe Sodom would have still been standing to this day. But he stopped at 10, and there weren't even 10 righteous in the whole city. But the point was that a righteous man interceded on behalf of a city that was ripe for judgment, and God was willing to listen. But when we get to this point in the nation of Judah, God says, even if you could bring Noah, Daniel, and Job, men known for their righteousness, and they were to intercede, they would only save their own lives, not anybody else's. So in other words, you're gone beyond the point of no return. Judgment is the only thing left. And so just an interesting thought. Now, one other reference to Daniel, and that is in chapter 28. And verse 3, and we read this, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So what we could say is this. Daniel has an amazing reputation 
among the captives. He is known for his piety, right? He's listed amongst these greats, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And then he has a wonderful reputation for wisdom. In fact, it, the ultimate compliment would be to say somebody was wiser than Daniel <laughs> because he was known for his great wisdom. So what an impression Daniel had clearly made. So these three, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, are all prophets connected with the captivity. Ezekiel lived in a context of spiritual declension and departure. Uh, the, the people had turned their backs on God. They were, they were in a great spiritual or spiritual condition. They were in distress. They were uprooted uh, from their homeland, taken into captivity. And it was all a direct result of divine discipline. And so you can imagine that morale was at a low ebb among the nation. And this is when he's called to minister. Now, again, I want to just kind of put the prophets side by side and just emphasize what each one is known for. So when we think of Isaiah, he is the prophet of the salvation of the Lord. In fact, um, I remember years ago uh, listening to a brother preach and he uh, gave messages on the salvation passages in the prophecy of Isaiah. And it was marvelous. And of course, that's his emphasis, the salvation of the Lord. Jeremiah, his emphasis is on the judgment of the Lord. Of course, he's the prophecy, a prophet, the weeping prophet called to pronounce judgment uh, on the people of Judah. Daniel, he is the prophet of the kingdom of the Lord. Remember, there's going to be a kingdom set up that is going to destroy all previous kingdoms, and reign through the whole earth. So the kingdom of the Lord. And then we come to Ezekiel, and he is the prophet of the glory of the Lord. And so his great theme is the glory of the Lord. The prophet Ezekiel stresses in a unique way the divine government of the universe. And we're going to see in chapter 1, he begins with uh, his prophecy with a vision of the throne of God, as it were, bringing judgment to Judah. Uh, this, this chariot vision that we're going to be looking at with one seated on a throne. Now you've got the wheels and you've got the living creatures, but the throne and the idea is that God, sovereign over the, the nations, the one who is in control of the government of the universe, and his message really to the 12 tribes is twofold. We're just kind of giving the summary before we get to the details. First of all, one of the first thing that Ezekiel is going to do is going to remind those in captivity of all the sins which brought about judgment and exile upon them. Why would he do this? Well, sadly, they're still unrepentant. They needed to see God's justice in judging them. They needed to see the state of their own heart. So he brings home to them. This is why you're in the predicament you're in. This is the sin that caused this divine discipline to come upon you. Secondly, he's writing to encourage and strengthen the faith of the godly remnant with prophecies of a future restoration and glory. And so he has the back of his mind. And of course, we're going to see the book's going to divide very clearly into two halves. In fact, let's do that right now. I want you to go with me to Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33 is the turning point of the book. It's when uh, things change uh, pretty much from judgment and doom and uh, uh, chastisement from there to predictions of coming glory being restored. And chapter 3, 33, 21, it says this, and it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity. So he's been, remember he was, he, he, he'd been in captivity five years when he begins preaching. So he's been preaching for seven years when this message comes. The 12th year of our captivity, it says in the 10th month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me saying, the city is smitten. 
they'd all continued to hope that they'd be restored to Jerusalem because the temple was still standing and the city was still intact. And so many of these captives, they kind of kept coming. When are we going back? When are we going back? We, we, we want to go back home. And the message comes, the city is smitten. Of course, 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed. 585 BC is when this news comes to Ezekiel concerning the fall of the city of Jerusalem. And so the, why this is the turning point is this. Up to this point, all he's been telling them is, you're going to be judged. The city is going to fall. It's, it's going to be destroyed. There's no turning back. Judgment is certain. And so his prophecies concerning the certainty of the doom of Jerusalem and their fulfillment now, here's evidence that this prophet is really speaking from God. What he said has come to pass. And so word has come, just as he said, it was going to fall. Now he begins to change his message. And from verse 21 onwards, we get a new message. After news of Jerusalem's fall and his previous predictions are confirmed, he begins to speak on the restoration and the return of the glory of God to the land. And so it becomes very, very positive from chapter 33 onwards. Now, a couple more things that I'd like to do in this general introduction. I want to make a couple of comparisons, first of all, between Ezekiel and the Apostle John in the New Testament and the book of Revelation. We studied that not too long ago, and so maybe it'll be fresh enough in our minds to be able to appreciate these parallels between Ezekiel and John in the book of Revelation. For instance, here's one obvious parallel. Both of them are prisoners in exile. John was on the Isle of Patmos, if you remember, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was, uh, as it were, a state prisoner of Rome uh, when he was given his vision. And what about Ezekiel? Well, again, he is taken captive uh, by the Babylonians, and he is in a foreign land away from home, experiencing captivity and exile. Both in their captivity and exile saw visions of heaven opened and a man on the throne and the glory of God. And so we could compare and we will compare Ezekiel 1 with Revelation chapters 4 and 5 and Revelation chapter 1, for instance, uh, where John was given this vision of the glory of God. Interestingly, that when both these men were given these visions of the glory of God, both responded in exactly the same way. They both fell on their faces. Remember chapter 1 of Ezekiel, verse 28, the very last phrase, I fell upon my face <laughs> and I heard a voice of one that spoke. When he saw the glory of God, he fell on his face. When John on the Isle of Patmos saw actually the glorified Christ, <laughs> what did he do? He said he fell on his face like a dead man. And so both had the same response. Uh, both of them ate a book and it was sweet to their taste, but bitter to their belly. So we might look at Ezekiel chapter three, for instance, and verse three, it said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. And then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And yet uh, we'll see uh, when we get to it that he, he goes to minister the people in the bit bitterness of his spirit as he uh, goes to speak to them. But, he, but it's sweet to his taste to begin with. I want you to notice too, uh, in the book of Revelation, we'll see exactly the same thing. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 10. Revelation 10, 10, it says, um, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And so we can see... Uh, a, a very clear uh, parallel there in these two passages. Both of them describe 
the four living creatures. Now, we're going to see in chapter one of Ezekiel, there's going to be a, dis a, a great description of these living creatures. We see it in verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, the four had the face of a man, the face of a lion. On the right side, the four had the face of an ox. On the left side, the four had the face of an eagle. And we're going to see when John in Revelation 4 and 5, he describes as well these four uh, beasts, Revelation calls them, living creatures, same thing. Uh, and basically, uh, he describes them in very similar uh, language. So both got to see that. Both begin their prophecies in captivity, but towards the end of their prophecies, they talk about a river that is very refreshing that comes out of the house of God. And so, for instance, Ezekiel, in chapter 47, he describes a river coming out from the temple. Ezekiel 47, verse 8. It says, then said he unto me, these waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which is being brought forth into the sea. The waters shall be healed. And so it actually goes out of the house of God and it runs down to the Dead Sea and the waters of the Dead Sea get healed by this water that will proceed out of the throne of God of the millennial temple. When we go to the revelation of, of John, We'll notice in chapter 21, Revelation 21, again, there's a reference to a river. But there's a difference in these rivers because the river in the Revelation doesn't go into the Dead Sea. How do we know that? Look at verse 1 of chapter 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. So clearly the river that he's going to describe is not going to go into the sea. Actually, ironically, I think it's Zechariah that tells us the river that Ezekiel describes. It, not only does it go into the Dead Sea, but it actually forks and half of it goes into the Mediterranean Sea. And so there's kind of a, a, a fork in the river. One goes into the Mediterranean, one goes into the Dead Sea. But when it comes to John's River, it doesn't go into any sea because there is no more sea. But look at 22, at verse 1, it says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceed out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life, uh, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And what we could just say simply is this, that uh, when we're going to compare... Revelation and Ezekiel, Ezekiel primarily gets a vision of millennial glory in the latter part of the book. We're all It's going to be all about the millennial kingdom. If you ever wondered about the millennial kingdom, we're in the book. This is the book about the millennial kingdom. When you look at Revelation, although it does mention the millennium in chapter 20, after chapter 20, we're no longer in the millennial kingdom. We're now talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And so that's what John will deal with in his prophecy. Both of these prophets also mention a great supper for the birds to come and feed after a great battle. And so, for instance, in Ezekiel 38, we won't take the time to turn there, but the battle of Gog and Magog, and he calls for the birds to come and feed on all of these carcasses that are in the land. And, of course, we know in Revelation 19 from the Battle of Armageddon again, uh, the, the birds are called to feed on captains and kings and all the rest of it. Now, again, two completely different battles. I believe perhaps uh, at least three and a half years, maybe longer between them. I believe that Gog and Magog will be in the first half of the tribulation period early on. I believe the Battle of Armageddon will be at the end of the tribulation. But birds are called to feed on the carcasses. Now, let me just say this. Uh, birds eat more than once every seven years. So it's not an issue to call for these birds to feed. <laughs> uh, they're going to be hungry after the first battle for another feed at this second battle. So that's just an interesting thing. And again, I just find these kind of put these things together. They're very interesting, the comparison between Ezekiel and John. One more comparison. 
between Ezekiel and Christ. There, there's some interesting comparisons. First of all, both began their ministry at 30 years of age. Came to pass in the 30th year, he says, verse 1. And again, many believe that that's how old he was, 30 years of age, when he began to minister. And when we look at the Gospel of Luke and the the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus, we read this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, and verse 23. And of course, we know that although the Lord Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi, he was a priest <laughs> after the order of Melchizedek. And the similarity is that he began his priesthood at 30 years. It says, verse 23, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Jules, if which was the son of Heli. And so there we have, supposed to be at 30 years of age. Both of them began their ministry at a river. The Lord Jesus' ministry began at the Jordan River. The ministry of Ezekiel began at the river Kibar. Both of them saw heaven opened, and both had the Spirit of God descend upon them. So I want you to look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, for the Lord Jesus, and then we'll go back and look at Ezekiel. Mark 1, verse 10, notice this, straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove, descending upon him now as we consider the lord jesus uh, sorry we consider ezekiel we'll see the same thing ezekiel 1 verse 1 it says it came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month in the fifth day of the month as i was among the captives by the river of kibar that the heavens were opened and i saw visions of god and then if you look at chapter 2 of ezekiel verse 2 it says the spirit entered on into me when he spoke unto me and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. So both of them, exact parallel, they both had that experience. Now, back to Ezekiel. And again, just continuing on with our introduction. And I know this maybe seems a bit lengthy, but I think it really is important to get the big picture before we begin to look at the actual details and so i think there's great value in kind of doing a little bit of an overview before we start set things in their right context and so one of the things that we'll find in the book of ezekiel is a lot of symbol symbolic actions uh, sometimes he gets to act out uh, some of his um, messages uh, he also uses allegories there's visions there's all kinds of things going on in ezekiel in fact, it's not easy to understand. In fact, young Jews were actually forbidden to read Ezekiel before they were 30 years of age, lest by the difficulties they met, they should be prejudiced against the scriptures. I don't think we'll have any difficulty in our little group today. I think you're all over 30, and so we can... We can engage with the difficulties <laughs> but interesting that it, it is considered to be a difficult book now i'm going to give you two different outlines um, that we could kind of look at to uh, as we explore the book together uh, the first one kind of takes up this idea of the glory of god and so i want to uh, suggest that in some ways the early part of the book of, of ezekiel you could call it ichabod the glory has departed because it reveals to us how the glory departed. So how does the book go? Well, chapters one through three begin with the glory revealed. So it starts out, he's given, as we saw at the end of verse one, it says, um, uh, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So first three chapters, really, it's kind of he gets a vision of the glory of God. It's revealed to the man, Ezekiel, he sees the glory of God. In chapter 4 through 24, he actually has the sad experience of watching the glory of God being removed from the nation. 
literally the glory departing. And just to, to show you what I mean and just to give you an example. So chapters 4 through 24, but uh, we'll just kind of zone in on some of the chapters like chapter 8. If you turn to chapter 8, verse 4, you'll notice this. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Now, he's he's been taken by the Spirit to Jerusalem, and he's seeing that the glory of God was there, like the vision he saw in the plain. So when he was in the banks of the Kibar, the same vision he saw there, he sees it again when he's taken to the temple. The glory of God is there. Okay, look at verse 6. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, Seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn thee yet again, thou shalt see greater abominations. So God is showing Ezekiel the reason why his glory cannot remain. Why it says, I should go far off from my sanctuary. Why should why should the glory of God leave the sanctuary? Because they have brought abominations into the very temple of God. And God is not going to share his glory with another, with idols. And so he's going to move out and he is going to withdraw from that area. Look at chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with a cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. So it's going up, you know, how normally the glory of God, where did it dwell? It dwelt between the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant. So what's happening? It goes up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. It's moving to the, the threshold, of the, the extremity of the house. And the, of course, the, the full of the brightness of the Lord's glory, but it's moving away. Where is it going? Look at verse 15. It says, And the, the cherubim were lifted up. And this is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kibar. And when the cherubim went, their wheels went by them. And when the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned from, uh, not from beside them. When they stood, these stood, and when they were lifted up, these were lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. So it's moving from the threshold of the house. Where is it going? Uh, let's look at verse 19. And the cherubim lift up their wings and mounted up from the earth at my, in my sight, when they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. So it moves from the sanctuary to the east gate of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, it's moving away slowly but surely. Look at chapter 11, verse 23. It says, uh, Verse 23, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So it goes from the extremity of the temple at the east gate to the mountain, which is toward the east. Guess what mountain that is? It's called the Mount of Olives. And the glory of God leaves from the Mount of Olives and departs and abandons the nation. Ichabod. The glory has departed. So it's it's when things are so bad in the house of God that the glory of God can no longer be at home there, that he has to remove himself. And of course, you say, well, is, is there any relevance to any of this for us? Well, it's, what's very interesting is that when you see the letters to the seven churches, one of the churches, the church of the Laodiceans, where is the Lord in that church? He's outside the door. He's knocking, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We could say that in a sense, Laodicea, for all its activity, and, and again, the temple, was still lots of activity going on, but the glory had departed. And sadly, the, the the church of the last days, it could well be that there are many churches 
where there's much activity, but the glory of the Lord has gone. The Lord is no longer in the midst. He can no longer stay. It is so perverse. It is so filled with abomination that he's outside. He still wants to come in and have fellowship. He's knocking, but he's asking the individual now. The, the corporate hole is gone. Is any man hear my voice? And so just interesting, the, the parallels here, again, between Ezekiel and John and Revelation. So from chapter 25 to 48, we're going to see the theme of the glory returning. So we've we've seen the glory revealed, one through three. We've seen four through 24, the glory removed. And then from 25 to the end of the book, the glory is going to come back in a coming day. In fact, the climax of the book of Ezekiel, if you look at chapter 48 and verse 35, you will read this, and it's very interesting, uh, the very last verse, it says, it was around about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city, and this is speaking of uh, Jerusalem, where the millennial temple will be, the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there, Jehovah Shema. <laughs> the Lord is there. The Lord is back in the midst. Now, how do we know he's back in the midst? Look at chapter 43. I want you to see in chapter 43, and particularly in verses 1 through 12, and we won't take time to read all of it, but just, just to see uh, the picture here. Uh, it says, uh, beginning um, verse uh, 1, it says, Afterwards he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. Remember, that's where the glory left, that east gate. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters. The earth shined with his glory. Verse 4, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. Verse 5, so the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Verse 7, he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. In my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither uh, neither they nor their kings, and the, by their whoredoms, by their carcasses of their kings and their high places. Verse 9, Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. And so what happens? The glory of the Lord comes back. Now, what's interesting, we said that the glory of the Lord went out of the east gate and went up to the Mount of Olives and then departed. When the glory of the Lord returns, it will come to the Mount of Olives. Remember what the Lord Jesus said? Or the angel said concerning the Lord, this same Jesus will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Where did he leave from? Mount of Olives. And then... What gate did he go out from? The East Gate. It's now blocked up. It's kind of interesting how the Muslims have been reading Bible prophecy, and they're so concerned about this that they've actually not only walled up the East Gate uh, so you can't get in, and you can see it. If you stand on the Mount of Olives, you can see it walled up, and in front of it, they've put a cemetery because they said Messiah would never, ever walk through a cemetery and defile it. But when the Lord Jesus puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, there's going to be a great earthquake. <laughs> and that earthquake is going to conveniently run right through the city. <laughs> and uh, there's a fault line there. And it's been they've been able to find that fault line. And guess what? It's going to go right through that cemetery and separate it, open the gate, and Christ is going to come in. And the glory of the God of Israel will return and dwell in the midst of them. So just amazing to think about those things. So that's that's one way we're going to look at it. We're, we're going to definitely take that approach. But just give you one more outline, because it's very helpful, I think, to just outline the book, uh, get some sense of it. And uh, again, just to say this, that I, I really do believe there are three main divisions in the book. So in chapters 1 through 24, he deals with the fall of Judah. And the the... The, the destruction of the city and all the rest of it, the fall of, of Judah uh, is described. And there's an interesting thing in chapter 24, and you see how this man often act to act out things. Um, he, he says in verse 16 of, of Ezekiel 24, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes, 
with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn, nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. And so the Lord told him, I'm going to, that your wife is going to die. In fact, he says, uh, verse 18, so I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died. And so his wife died. And he's told not to mourn for his wife. And it's a picture of what God is going to do to Jerusalem and to Judah. He says in verse 24, thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign according to all that he hath done shall ye do. And when this cometh, you will know that I am the Lord God. And so, in a sense, a sign of the fall of Judah was the death of Ezekiel's wife and how he was not to mourn. Neither They're not going to have time to mourn either. They're going to be taken into captivity, uh, great destruction. And so, through 24, the fall of Judah. Chapter 25 through 32, we have the foes of Judah. And there's a description of the seven nations that surround Israel, Ammon, Moab, Edom, the Philistines, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. And in the midst of these seven nations, by the way, is chapter 28, where there's a revelation of Lucifer and the fall of Lucifer. And it's interesting that both in Isaiah's prophecy and in Ezekiel's prophecy, when you've got judgment on the nations, the one who's behind the nations, deceiving the nations, stirring up the anti-Semiticism and the hatred of the Jews. You have a, the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah, Isaiah 14. You have the fall of Lucifer in Ezekiel 28. And the thought is this, that behind these hostile nations who have always hated Israel, behind them is none other than the one who hates God and therefore hates Israel. And it indeed is the great deceiver, Satan himself. Now, just again, to look at this little section, um, I want to just mention examples of what I mean by their hostility towards Israel. So, for instance, uh, Ezekiel 25, verse 3, it says, Say unto the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, because thou saidst, Aha! against my sanctuary when it was profaned and against the land of Israel when it was desolate and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. Verse 6, For thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast clapped thine hands and stamped with thy feet and rejoiced in heart with all thy despite against the land of Israel. And so the Ammonites actually were rejoicing at the destruction of Jerusalem. They were they were clapping their hands. They were stamping, and and you've seen scenes like this where some bomb has gone off in Israel, some disaster has happened, and you see crowds in the in the West Bank, or you'll see crowds in Gaza, and they'll be they'll be shouting like even September the eleventh, uh, when in their minds the great Satan got a great blow. They're dancing in the streets. They're celebrating. And so that's the picture here. Uh, these enemies celebrating the demise of the nation. And so we, we could give more examples, but that will suffice. Really, God is going to show that all these hostile nations are going to be judged. And he's going to go on a full circle of judgment on the nations that surround Judah by following them in a clockwise circuit. <laughs> so he's just going to go right around these nations, show God's des desolation and destruction of them. Final section, 33 through 48, the future of Judah. And this is when the glory returns. This is when the millennial temple is built. This is when they're going to be his people. He's going to be their God. This is when uh, the graveyard, they're going to be brought back uh, to the land. So very, very significant. Now, just a couple of further points, and then we'll be done for our hour this morning. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about some of the key phrases and key words in Ezekiel. Uh, he abounds in repetition. He's my kind of guy. I like repetition. I like I like reading the Bible and seeing repeated phrases, and it really helps me understand the scriptures. And so he has some key phrases he loves to uh, re repeat over and over. So, for instance, the phrase "Lord God" is mentioned over two hundred times. Uh, so 
just interesting that the Lord God, he just keeps over 200 times. Thus saith the Lord 120 times. So again, God is clearly speaking here. The word of the Lord came unto me 49 times. 49 times he gets a message from God. God's word came to him. The spirit is mentioned 25 times. That's why people say that he is the prophet of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I do believe when the Lord said to Nicodemus um, concerning these things, he says, are you a teacher in Israel? You don't understand these things. A paraphrase would be saying, didn't you read Ezekiel? <laughs> if you'd have read Ezekiel, you wouldn't be surprised about the new birth and about the spirit moving where he wills. That wouldn't shock you if you knew the book of Ezekiel. They shall know that I am God 60 times. Captiv captivity was the cure for idolatry. By the end of captivity, they know that he is God and they're done with their idols. And so they shall know that I am God. And then final phrase, and with this we'll end our study today, son of man, more frequently used than anywhere in the Bible, 90 times our Ezekiel is given the title son of Adam, son of man. <laughs> and we'll talk about the reason why, but we'll have to wait till next week uh, to find that out. May the Lord encourage us with this study. Amen.